half my life ago, as a young idealistic conservationist, I first set foot in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And I went to meet people called the Warani. The Warani are a remarkable native Amazonian society. They number a few thousand people, and they have only been in sustained peaceful contact with the outside world since 1958. In their language, Warani means the people. Outsiders like us are called Kawuri, a term meaning non-human cannibal. <laughs> For generations, the Warani have defended a vast territory, a forest, about 15 square miles for every man, woman, and child. And they defended this territory with the use of nine foot long pointed spears, used in unpredictable spearing raids on outsiders and even other rival Warani clans. And while they were incredibly hostile to outsiders, they were remarkably peaceful with each other. They lived in small, semi-nomadic, extended kin groups called Nani Kabori. And within these groups, they were incredibly sharing, and there's a lot of laughter. And these groups were very semi-nomadic, better to disperse yourselves and be less discernible to your enemies. And all of this, the hostile defense of their territory, their semi-nomadism, and their low population density, all of this pointed to an incredible force of bounty that the Warani maintained. Their lands represent some of the most intact forests in all of Ecuador, and some of the most biodiverse forests in the entire world. And this biodiversity is important for their sense of well-being. For the Warani, a good life means having a lot of game from the forest to eat and to share with each other as expressions of reciprocity and of egalitarianism that are critical to their sociality. So this sociality, so here's this amazing forest. So this sociality is maintained by this biodiversity and that biodiversity is, is captured because the Warani are such incredible hunters. They are able to detect this, an animal and identify it from the smell of urine dripping from the forest canopy. A proficient Warani hunter can consistently hit an overhead target 12 stories above with a blowgun. And all of this brought me to Ecuador as a young person, as someone so enamored with this incredible, this remarkable people who were the foil to us, to Western society, and our estrangement from nature. And I went to try to learn from their conservation knowledge. Let me just show you a picture of myself during this first trip to Ecuador. <laughs> I show you this because when we speak about the Warani, the image for many Westerners is something not far afield from the fictitious Navi from the movie Avatar. We see indigenous peoples as pure, untainted by civilization, pristine, timeless, static beings who are in eternal harmony with nature. We see them as simultaneously wise yet childlike, fierce yet fragile, relics of a past, but perhaps keys to a more sustainable future. And perhaps this is the most predominant way that we essentialize groups like the Warani as ecologically noble savages and inherent conservationists. So when I first went to the Warani 20 years ago to ask them about their conservation, I was actually quite puzzled by the answers that they gave me. They did not seem to have the concept of conservation. They didn't have definitions for it. They didn't seem to have practices or behaviors that fostered conservation. And I asked myself, why aren't they conservationists? So some people might say, well, it's because groups like the Warren are changing. They're wearing Western clothes. They are um, having televisions and, and cell phones and using chainsaws and using firearms rather than blowguns and bows and arrows to hunt. And this fact has led some people to even say that the Warani are now acculturated and that they're inauthentic, corrupted, and even enemies of nature. There are some predominant conservation biologists who say that the only potential allies for conservation with Western conservation organizations are those indigenous peoples who are pristine, who have small population densities, who use only traditional technologies, and are part of only subsistence economies. And yet, this Amazonian imaginary, the stories that we tell about other people, this imaginary is not only morally problematic, but logically invalid. The reason why the Warani did not answer my questions about conservation to my satisfaction many, many years ago was because my questions were ethnocentric and misguided. 
Conservation is not an inherent characteristic that some people have and others don't. It is something that is gained from hard-earned experience of, of overexploiting a resource, realizing your folly, and, and trying to do better. It is an experience that we as Westerners know very well, and the Warani less so. For the Warani, their history as a people in a particular environment has been characterized more by resource plenty. Yes, they have absolutely have incredible knowledge about the, the rainforest, flora, and fauna. They have cosmological and spiritual ties to this ecosystem. But because they have not experienced scarcity, there was no need for conservation. It was not something that they automatically had to do to restrain their resource use because they defended such a vast territory. We would expect that indigenous societies who are practicing conservation are doing so because they feel resource pressure, because their populations are growing, because their lands are being circumscribed. The result of sustained contact with the outside world has meant that the Warani have faced a juggernaut of change. Pacification by missionaries opened up swaths of their forests to oil extraction. Extraction that was led by U.S. companies and produced oil for export to energy-hungry U.S. consumers. This oil extraction resulted in massive environmental degradation, contamination, and undermined the resource base for many of these indigenous groups. It caused social trauma and great vulnerability. And the Warani are struggling to adapt to these things. They're trying to find a way in light of increasingly scarce resources, scarce game, fewer healthy forests, about how to cope. And as predicted, they are, thanks to the forces that we set in motion, starting to articulate a conservation ethic. Now the Warani tell me about how they try to hunt less, disperse hunting pressure, fish more than hunt. They're increasingly concerned about the future for their children as well. They are now potentially great allies for Western conservationists if only we would see beyond our images of ecologically noble savages, if only we could see beyond our Amazonian imaginaries and see them as valuable allies in our efforts for conservation. As the Warani become more westernized, for instance, you can find some on Facebook, um, I'm also noticing that many Westerners are becoming more Warani, like here in Santa Cruz. And this fact gives me hope because it means that maybe we have the possibility of interacting with each other as societies not predicated on some notion of an exotic other, but that we can see each other as identities that are hybrid, complicated, dynamic, and sometimes contradictory. That we can move beyond notions of conservation that are so fixed and universal and really see their cultural and historical dependency. That for us to have meaningful collaboration, what it's going to take is an appreciation of the complex realities of contemporary indigenous peoples, whose physical and cultural survival hang in the balance, and who, more than any of us, have more at stake in the future of their Amazonian home. Thank you.